<laughs> they will in a minute. <laughs> it, it implies there is already that awareness arising in you where you become aware of what your mind is doing. It's an enormous thing. So the, the shift then, you can, you can use waiting periods instead of complaining just being present, enter the, feel the presence that you are, the alertness. And at that moment, you become a spiritual master. Because all that differentiates a person who is not yet awake from a spiritual master is that the spiritual master can be in the state of presence, which is complete alignment with the present moment without complaining about anything. <laughs> just is. That's the Zen master. He goes... This is what is. What are you complaining about? <laughs> and this is why there was a Zen master who would never answer any questions. All he would ever do when people asked him questions about the meaning of Zen was he would raise his finger and look at you. <laughs> Can you explain the meaning of Zen, please? Did you hear what I said? Did you hear my question? <laughs> He's simply teaching presence, alert presence. That's Zen, nothing else. And this, people spend years in Zen monasteries and they still don't get it. <laughs> because they think, I need to understand something. The Course in Miracles says, your understanding is not a powerful contribution to the truth. <laughs> now, the, the miracle is when you give up the need to understand yourself, my life, I need to figure out my life. <clears throat> what is your life? It's a mental construct. So you're trying to figure out a mental construct that you call my life, and it's very complex. I need to figure out what it's all about, where am I going, what am I doing? Why not give up the need to understand and just invite presence in? And then it looks for a moment, from the point of view of the mind, as if you didn't know anything anymore. And you don't, not conceptually. So you voluntarily enter that state of not knowing, and then you realize, out of that state of not knowing, a deeper knowing arises and a deeper sense of connectedness with life and a deeper sense of connectedness with other humans and all life forms. And that is the awakening and the shift in consciousness. And now I'm handing this chair over to Deepak. Right this moment, as, as you're about to listen to me, uh, just turn your attention to who's listening. So, as you're looking at me, turn your attention to who's looking. That's you. Okay. That you has always existed. It was there when you were a baby. It was there a different body, different mind. It was there when you were a teenager. Different body, different mind. It's there now. And actually, if you stay with it, without anyone explaining to you, you'll realize that it's that timeless being in which time is born. Time is just the movement of thought. Time is the movement of thought that creates a subject-object split. 
me, Deepak, Eckhart, okay, all of you. That's a thought, that's a thought. And it is the movement of thought that creates time. But the real you is not in time. The real you is the timeless observer in the midst of time-bound observation. So as, as Eckhart said, you know, you can, you can spend your whole life studying scripture and spend your whole life in various practices. And it does help, you know, it takes uh, time for a fruit to ripen, but then one day it falls. And the falling can be quite sudden, as in your case it was. Transcendence is simply going beyond the subject-object split, which is artificial. It's not real. Nature and the universe is a single process. So the subject-object split is, is an artificial split. And it is the cause of every single problem that we know. So I come from a tradition which is called Vedanta, which you referred to when you mentioned Sri Ramana Maharishi. And uh, Buddha came many years later and actually did uh, refine in his own language the teachings of Vedanta. But in the Vedanta there are what are called the five kleshas. The klesha is a Sanskrit word which means the cause of suffering. So the five kleshas are, number one, not knowing who you are. Number two, the addiction and the craving for permanence in a world that is inherently impermanent. Number three is the fear of impermanence. Number four is identifying with your self-image instead of yourself. What Eckhart was saying, all the labels. So all the labels, all the definitions, all the evaluations, all the judgments, all the ideas, all the concepts that have come from conditioning, parents, children, you know, your parents, your siblings, your culture, religion, history, economic conditions, all these things are collected and then identified with, and that becomes the self-image, the conditioned mind. So that's the fourth klesha. And the fifth klesha is the fear of death. It's the fear of the unknown. It's the fear that actually is the basis of all religion, at least institutionalized religion, capitalizes on the fear of death. And in a way, all fear is the fear of death in disguise. Because what is the fear of death? It's, as I said, the fear of the unknown, but it's also the fear of, I'm trying to hold on to something that's not going to be there in the next moment. Okay. Because in the real world, we do not have objects. In the real world, objects do not exist. That's a perceptual artifact. Okay? There's only process. Only process. A simple way of saying this is that there are no nouns 
only verbs. The universe is a verb, it's an activity. And being an activity, it never stops. Okay, so when even as you're looking at me or yourself, your body or your mind, your body is constantly changing. It actually, even scientifically, the body that you have right now is not the body that you walked in with a little while ago. Because you're breathing, you're thinking, you're taking in information from the world, you have relationships, you eat, you eliminate, all these processes are constantly the flux of your physical body. So, as I said, the body you walked in with is not the body that you have right now. And of course, in less than a year, every single atom in your body has been replaced, recycled. You don't have the same body you had as a kid, as a baby, as a teenager. So if you think you're your body, you have a little bit of a dilemma. Which one are you talking about? And if you think you're your mind, you also have a dilemma because the mind is changing all the time. And so here we go, bamboozled by the idea that things exist. Things don't exist. Only process exists. Nouns are conventions of language. They are not facts of reality. It's a language convention. There's no noun. Not even this microphone is not a noun. It has a little longer shelf life, though, than the body and the mind. But there are no nouns. So all the suffering comes from nouns, things, which don't exist. Okay. So we go over those five kleshas, not knowing who you are, trying to fix the flux, which won't be fixed, <laughs> afraid of the flux, identifying with ideas instead of who you are, ideas about yourself, as you said, and the fear of death. And the great teaching of the Vedanta is that all these five causes of suffering are contained in the first cause. And that is not knowing you, who you are. Confusing yourself with a socially induced hallucination that actually doesn't exist. And the key, therefore, is who am I? I mean, Sri Ramana Maharishi spent 20 years in silence, and if people asked him a question, no matter what the question was, he would say, who's asking the question? And uh, sometimes he would say, not only who's asking the question, but um, who is the who that is asking the question? And, you know, when you say, who am I, then you could also ask yourself, who's asking, who am I? And if you go a little bit deeply into that, you'll come to the place that um, Eckhart was talking about, that who's asking the question is a transcendent being that is neither the subject of experience nor the object of experience. So very frequently we say, I'm the observer, but even that is not correct. Okay? The observer and the observed, me and the other, simultaneously co-arise as the movement of thought. The real you is neither the observer nor the observed, but in which both the observer, the subject, and the object of experience simultaneously arise and simultaneously subside. And they're doing so in every moment. That's the flux. Okay, it's a, it's a flux that is constantly creating a subject and object. But the real being is neither the subject or the object. It's where the subject and object arise like waves on the ocean and subside. So before a wave arises, it's water. 
as a wave, it's water, and when it subsides, it's water. It doesn't lose its wateriness. And that's being. You are the being in which thought arises and subsides. Now, that thought can have many qualities, okay? These qualities of thought are referred to in, in the consciousness literature. They're referred to as qualia. Now, everybody has heard these days, thanks partly to my obsession with quanta, okay? Quanta. What is quanta? It means quantity. Okay, so quantum physics is the study of quantities of units of mass and energy. It's the smallest indivisible unit of information and energy is a quanta. But remember, quanta are units of measurement. Qualia, on the other hand, are units of thought or qualities of consciousness. And there are usually just four of them. Anytime you have any experience, anytime you have any experience, you're either experiencing a sensation somewhere, or you're experiencing an image, or a feeling, emotion, or a thought. Now, Dan Siegel, who's a great friend of ours, is a neuropsychiatrist at UCLA. He says he uses an acronym, SIFT, S-I-F-T. Every experience that you have is either a sensation, or an image, or a feeling, or a thought. All of perceptual experience, all of perceptual experience, all of cognitive experience, or any experience, is actually just consciousness and its qualities. Okay, so right now I'm experiencing you as image and sensation in my body, in my consciousness. I experience my own body like that. I experience you like that. Sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts are occurrences in consciousness of consciousness. So even though I see this as mine and your body as different than mine, actually what I'm experiencing as you and what I'm experiencing as my body are just sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts. And the whole universe is nothing other than that. Consciousness experiencing itself as the subject and the object, but both the subject, the individual subject, and the individual object are movements of consciousness within consciousness. Okay, so that's why the great sayings of the great rishis, they say, I'm not in the world, the world is in me. I'm not in the body, the body is in me. I'm not in the mind, the mind is in me. In, in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna, when he's talking to Arjuna, he says, Prakritim swam vashd by Vishrajami, puna puna. Curving back within myself, I create again and again. It's the mechanics of how we create our experience of the body, we create our experience of the mind, and we create our experience of the world. If we totally understand that and come back to what Eckhart was saying, that you can't find this presence by looking for it because it's the one that's looking. Okay? You can't find consciousness by looking for it because consciousness is the one that's looking. You know, in my field as a person who is trained in neuroscience, biology, endocrinology. Today, there's a lot of, lot of interest in consciousness as a brain phenomenon, because that's how we are trained. We think hey, consciousness is a perceptual object, but where is, where is the brain experience? When you think about the brain, where is that experience? In consciousness. When you look at a brain as a perceptual object, that's also in consciousness. So consciousness is prior to brain. Okay? Even the experience of the brain is 
the perceptual experience of the brain is a qualia. It's a quality of consciousness within consciousness. So coming back to what he was saying is all this neuroscience that we're doing, which is fun, a lot of fun to do, it's very inferential, but we will never understand consciousness by looking at a brain or through neuroscience. Why? Because only consciousness can know consciousness. Only consciousness can understand consciousness. Only consciousness can experience consciousness. Any neuroscience validation of consciousness is inferential. It's not direct. Direct is the presence this moment. So when I started, I said, as you're listening to me, turn your attention to who's listening. Or as you're looking at me, just, just turn your attention to the space between you and me. Presence is always there. It gets overshadowed, as Eckhart was saying, by the furniture. Narumi has a very beautiful poem. He says, who am I in the middle of all this thought traffic? Because there's the center of being in which all the traffic is happening. And we are obviously uh, mm -hmm. identifying ourselves with the furniture and the traffic instead of this presence around which the traffic is being generated as a result of self-interaction. The internal dialogue, as Eckhart was saying, speaking to yourself. And that, that never stops because we're so influenced by the quality of awareness which is always looking out there for ultimately what is called happiness or fulfillment. Okay, get the right job, I'll be happy. Get the right person, I'll be happy. Get uh, a lot of money, win the lottery, I'll be happy. Uh, get good health, I'll be happy. But realize what Eckhart said earlier, all that is thought. Okay, all that is thought. If I do this. So before the thought arises, you're already happy. And after the thought subsides, you're exactly where you started from. Okay? Before a thought arises, you were at peace. Then the thought arose, then you did everything to fulfill that outcome of that thought, which we call desire. And at the end, you were back where you started from. Just like uh, before the wave arises, it's the ocean, and after the wave subsides, it's back into the ocean. So that makes it very obvious that happiness or joy is the starting point. It's also the ending point. You know, what's that poem, T.S. Eliot, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of our exploring is to arrive where we started from. At the end of our exploring is to arrive where we started from and know the place for the first time. So what Eckhart was saying is, you know, instead of searching, just actually go back to where you started from. It's a journey without distance. And when you realize that, that it's a journey without distance, you turn the quality of your awareness to being present. Now, it's very interesting. We can say this many times, and you know, you can hear this, and you can go out, and then you get distracted. You get distracted. And then something happens at some point where you realize that you don't need to be distracted. You can be the timeless being in the midst of time-bound activity. 
you can be the hub around which the whole universe arises and subsides. Because the whole universe, by the way, is nothing but sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts within consciousness. Okay, so there's a very important Mahavakya. Mahavakya means big idea. And it's still an idea <laughs> till you experience it in Sanskrit. Aham Brahmasmi. Aham means I am, Brahmasmi, the universe. Because that's the only identity we have. We are the totality of the universe, the totality of the universe, as a continuum of space-time events now. But that space-time events, the continuum is just a flux. It's coming and going, coming and going. So we go back to the fifth klesha, the fear of death. People say, where do I go when I die? Okay. Let me ask you a question just now. Um, what did you have for lunch today? What did you have for lunch? Salad? Where did you have lunch? <laughs> <laughs> 